You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcast. Uh, my guest is Stephanie Schnorr. She's a postdoctoral fellow at uh, University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And we're going to be talking about human diet and digestion and gut microbiome uh, in the framework of uh, human evolution, which sounds super interesting. So, Stephanie, thanks for coming. Oh, thanks so much for inviting me. Yeah, so th- it sounds like, uh, I guess, somewhat of an unusual topic. How did you get interested in, uh, you know, what people have eaten throughout, you know, thousands or hundreds of years? <laughs> yeah, combine those two. So it's hundreds of thousands of years that I'm most interested in. Mm. Um, but it, yeah, it's a bit of a backstory. Um, but formally, I've had all of my education in anthropology. So I've always been interested in the study of human evolution and specifically um, uh, biological anthropology. So the biological underpinning, underpinnings of what makes us human. And um, I, I guess I was originally kind of coming uh, into my graduate work thinking about sports performance and how to optimize um, the function of human body in sport. And that led me to thinking about neuromuscular function, metabolism, energy needs, nutritional needs. And then I sort of stepped back and, and remembered my training from college and thought about, okay, well, there's obviously evolutionary underpinnings to all of this. And then kind of stepping back a little bit further from that and really thinking, okay, well, what is actually needed? What's necessary in order to feel um, and sustain an entire human organism? So that obviously led me to thinking about the um, diet and human evolution. Uh, And so I was able to, I was really fortunate that I was able to start a um, graduate student uh, uh, dissertation work uh, looking at exactly that. Um, What, what is kind of our um, sort of alternatives to not just uh, our alternatives to meat in human evolution, but um, looking at the plant foods in human evolution, which I found to be very enticing as a research subject because it's not often talked about and plants um, have a lot of very interesting nutritional components that we need. And um, from there, I kind of fell into thinking about um, how are we extracting, how are we actually obtaining this nutrition with our very kind of restrictive um, simplified digestive system. So our gut is kind of, is very unspecialized and simple. And, and then that launched me into this entire investigation on the human gut microbiome, because I thought, well, okay, we know a lot about what's going on from mouth to small intestine, but what happens in the colon and what its contribution is to human health had not really been well explored at this time. This was around 2010, 2011. So, um, that made me think, obviously we need to start talking about what could be the contribution of gut microbiome and um, colonic fermentation in sort of the sum of uh, nutritional acquisition for humans. So what what does science know about what people have been eating for hundreds of thousands of years? Does it know a lot? Are there huge gaps? Does it know very little? What's, you know, you look over history, what what do we know? Yeah, it's kind of all of those at once. Um, We know a lot. But there's obviously a lot to know. So there's a lot of gaps in our knowledge and it's impossible to know everything. Um, We have very good records from bones and stones, uh, the tools um, that preserve through millions of years. And um, but what's missing is the record of of, um, plants. And so we tend to have this narrative that um, our early kind of Australopithecines, so 
once uh, the human lineage split off from our great ape cousins, we, we have this narrative that we started to increasingly incorporate meat into the diet. And to some extent, that's true. Um, and certainly humans became um, very capable hunters at some point, or humans or, or possibly, you know, um, a human ancestor. Uh, but we don't really have a good record of what was filling in the gaps um, in between these meat meals, these, these kills that must have been extremely um, valuable, but also fairly sporadic um, and possibly early on very hard to obtain and opportunistic only in the sense that perhaps humans could only scavenge what was left over um, by uh, prime predators such as uh, um, different uh, cats during, that were living during this time. So um, we do have very good information from existing uh, hunter-gatherers and learning from them, we've kind of been able to tease back uh, or sort of pull back the veil of of time a bit and say, okay, here's here's what's going on in a modern kind of context in a, in a hunting and gathering society. Um, and here we see what is where are the values and what is the contribution of different uh, foods in their diet. And so we can say, okay, this this was likely there was likely a similar situation in that humans needed to obtain some form of starch uh, in their diet, such as from tubers, underground storage organs. Um, this tends to be the potatoes part of the meat and potatoes, if you reduce it down to that kind of simplistic dichotomy. Um, but also, uh, so different forms of starch or different forms of uh, plant carbohydrates, and especially um, very difficult to digest polysaccharides. Uh, one example I can give that's really intriguing is that um, North American uh, hunter gatherers, so um, basically the, the early Native Americans sustained um, a, in large part on um, different underground storage organs that were comprised of inulin. And inulin is a carbohydrate that cannot be broken down by the human digestive system. And so it requires long duration cooking to slowly break down these long chains of uh, what are ultimately fructose sugars chain linked together. And so um, we just have this, this diversity of um, plants and their nutritional components in our diet that um, you can find uh, temporally uh, across time and you can find in present day context or even um, in very recent living memory or, or history and historical context. And you can see that there's just this array of nutritional elements um, that there's no one kind of simple diet that we can pin down and say, this is human diet. But what we do know is that human diet is extremely varied and it tends to have um, a predominance of at least 50% of um, plant food uh, contribution. So it seems like humans were opportunistic. You know, if you were uh, Inuit or Eskimo, you know, there's not much up there except mm -hmm. seals and whales and things like that. You <laughs> ate that. And then if you lived in the, you know, the tropics, exactly. you probably ate plants most of the time and, and an animal exactly. occasionally, right? Right. Yeah. I would, I would, it, 100% agree that humans are really the prime opportunists. Um, and it's really demonstrated by the fact that we've been able to occupy just about every uh, ecology across the globe, um, including extreme polar uh, and Arctic locations, and then also in the tropics and also in um, marine or aquatic, uh, where aquatic resources are the dominant resource. And, and that we are just able to adapt um, our environment to meet our needs. And I guess that, you know, that also supports our uh, digestive system being simple and what's interchangeable, I guess, is the set of gut bacteria that allows us to digest whatever we happen to be eating or changing to yeah. eating over time. So, yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, you've really kind of pinpointed what I'd say is um, a major hypothesis of mine going into this work. Um, so kind of what, what kicked it off is I thought, oh, I want to find out, I want to look at the physiology of the gut and, I, and because you know, so looking at that, I want to try to understand what, how has evolution shaped humans, and therefore, what are we specialized to do to eat? And and actually, almost the exact opposite kind of revelation through my study in this was that oh, actually, we we tend to lose a lot of these specializations as we as we proceed through time um, along the human lineage, and we seem to be less and less specialized, which is actually what our specialization is, is that 
we have no specialization, that that we are very malleable, very adaptable. And and so, yeah, that kind of brought me to this idea that maybe the gut microbiome is a way that we can kind of leverage nuance and rapid mutation, evolution, and change, but at the microbial scale and at the microbial ecological scale. And that perhaps these communities of microorganisms that live inside of us can provide things that we have lost perhaps in uh, the course of evolution or um, or just uh, that we, we never had to begin with, such as the ability to metabolize different, um, very refractory or difficult to digest uh, carbohydrates that tend to be in a, um, a generalized primate diet. So, um, and, and humans are no exception to that. But from what I learned, I mean, it starts with, uh, you know, with birth, like in a vaginal birth, the baby's bathed in the mother's microbiome. And then, you know, in breast milk, there's like different oligosaccharides that uh, we can't digest, but attracts certain bacteria to take up residence in, in a baby's mm-hmm. gut. So it's, uh, you know, from the very beginning, we need our, you know, a microbiome to uh, to help us start digesting stuff. Yeah, certainly, and and we know that um, when there's some sort of deviation or malfunction, we see this in in organisms that are are specifically bred to uh, be sterile and to have no microbiome. That um, what comes with that is kind of a, a array or a panoply of problems that um, from uh, malfunctioning of the immune system and malfunctioning of the, of, uh, the metabolic activity in the body, and so. Yeah, you're you're exactly right. Um, sounds like you've done your research on this. Um, that you know, early seeding of the microbiome um, seems to have profound uh, long-term implications of um, an individual's health, or at least susceptibility to disease. Um, but but what's really um, interesting and and also um, I guess I guess kind of a relief to hear is that it's not a completely deterministic process and that um, say, you know, if somebody was born by cesarean section, which, you know, um, anecdotally and, and, and personally I was, so I was a C-section baby. Um, it, it doesn't mean that you are destined to have a lifetime of predisposition to diseases or, or chronic illness. And, and so what's, what's really kind of rewarding, I guess, in pursuit of this kind of research is that we can understand how, in spite of all of our tinkering uh, in nature and um, all of our technological kind of process or progress, um, we can still overcome or we can still sort of rebuild what we seem to have lost or what we seem to be missing um, by, uh, by skipping over what, what nature has sort of built for us as far as uh, natural birth and breastfeeding. Um, and so it, it's not necessarily a, uh, a, a downward spiral if you were, if you happen to be born by cesarean section or if you happen to have been bottle fed. So it seems to be a very and, uh, fluid kind of ecology, ecological system. Yeah, no, I, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I've thought of, um, you know, what are you doing if you're eating the same limited diet all the time versus eating a very diverse diet, you know, like uh, the more diverse you eat, the more diverse bacteria that will probably take up residence within you. And what does that do for you? Does that, you know, does that diversity help your immunity to, uh, you know, to other pathogens? Does it, I don't know. I mean, does it, what, what does it do to your ability to digest foods and, uh, you know, mm-hmm. does it compromise what you're eating before? Does it make it better? Does it, uh, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I guess you can study populations of people. Some are very diverse eaters. Some are very narrow eaters. So, Today, contemporarily, there's all these uh, groups that could be looked at for info. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. And everything you're asking are kind of open questions. Um, and there is a lot of focus on diversity and its meaning and whether or not we ultimately should strive for diversity um, above all else. And um, when you ask about diversity of diet and, and um, kind of infer this, that a higher diversity of food confers uh, higher diversity in the gut microbiome, but it really matters what you mean by diversity and whether or not you're talking about diversity of the types of foods that you're eating um, or the diversity of the nutrients of those foods. And so uh, myself and many others argue that it's the diversity of the particular nutrients of those foods. So 
Um, you may be eating, a, a, you know, what you would consider a very diverse diet, at least in our kind of uh, modern Western industrial agricultural sort of um, bedding that we're that we're in. However, most of those foods have been genetically engineered in some form um, to provide us with nutrients that we desire the most. And so we have sort of engineered all of our crops to um, supply us with very digestible um, and often mainly macronutrient type of uh, nutrients rather than um, all of these other micronutrients that we need, um, micronutrients that are much more heavily provided in wild types of these plants, and also in the form of the polysaccharides. So again, the, the carbohydrates, um, the sugar-based polymers of, uh, that, that are the structural components and also the macronutrient components of these plants. So when you talk about diversity and, and wanting to make this kind of one-to-one -one, um, association between diversity of the diet and diversity in the microbiome, I think it's really important to establish that we, we're really talking about the diversity of the nutrients themselves rather than the diversity of the types of food. Well, a lot of people don't even have diversity in the type of processed food they're eating, much less diversity yeah, it, in raw food right. or wild so, caught or, you know, so there's two so levels. Almost you know? by, right. Almost by definition, you know, processed food is the absence of diversity. Processed food is the absence of, of anything that's kind of nuanced. It's, it's, it's entirely refined, uh, processed, simple to digest, um, sugar, fat, protein for the most part, but mainly sugar and fat. Uh, and, and sure, um, Diets that are comprised of whole foods can still be simple diets in terms of they may just be cellulose, water, uh, and starch. And so, um, yeah, it, it really, it, it may be somewhat counterintuitive what is, what is actually diverse in terms of diversifying your microbiome. Well, I can hear that you like to uh, think about things. So what, what do you imagine would happen if... Uh... You, know, you strive to eat a lot of raw, wild-caught stuff, you know, local honey and local this and that and different plants from different regions. And, you know, you, you try to have, like, a really diverse diet. What do you think would happen mm -hmm. first with your microbiome and what's, how would that change your physiology or way of living? What do you, what do you postulate would happen? And what do you postulate mm -hmm. what happens okay. with the opposite, with someone that eats, like, McDonald's and restaurant food and just process garbage all the time. And that's, that's all they eat. If you compare the two, wow. what do you think the differences would be? But I mean, I think those are almost incomparable. I mean, and um, I think it'd be really important or really relevant to actually compare somebody uh, who, like you say, might be foraging in, in their local environment for wild food um, versus somebody who may be eating something, what we would consider a healthy kind of uh, typical diet, uh, like a Mediterranean diet. So um, let's just try and keep things a little bit simple and just maybe change the source of the food. But we're still talking about maybe um, prescribed healthy diet. And one that may, both diets may confer, you know, uh, your sort of daily recommended amounts of fiber and vitamins and minerals and, and so on. Um, but I think what would really be kind of the important distinction here is that somebody that would be foraging wild plants or, or wild foods um, is having this interaction with the environment. That somebody that is just your average uh, whole food, you know, or three store forager <laughs> will be missing out on. And so the, the store-bought food tends to be obviously a product of modern agriculture, and it's also highly sterile. And so the, the person who is able to forage for their food would be coming into contact with the panoply of microorganisms that live in the environment, soil, and and that includes uh, not just bacteria, but yeast and, and fungi and eukaryotes, you know. Um, and then from there, I mean, it just kind of scales up depending on maybe where their drinking water is coming from. Like you're talking about really just an embodiment of environmental microorganisms. And I mean, it, other than saying that this is, I think, certainly going to lead to an increased diversity um, of, of the microbiome, possibly also an increased diversity of the amount of intestinal discomforts you're going to receive in the process. Um, I mean, I think already there's going to be a stark contrast in the 
physiological differences or manifestations, at least in the microbiome between these two uh, particular examples. Um, and when you go from there to somebody who's just eating a, a, a refined diet, as you say, somebody that's just eating McDonald's every day, um, then you're going to see an extremely uh, scaled down um, microbiome, as in uh, I've, I've actually, I've looked at um, some uh, gut microbiome from, from people who have exactly this kind of diet, and it is just it's stark how few representative um, species or taxa that, that you actually see, and, and how little change there must be in order to kind of bolster that, that number um, to kind of a more respectable ecosystem. So, um, so while it doesn't take very much, you know, push to kind of help help seed the system, there is certainly a huge uh, range of variations that that we see in, in present day diet. Yeah, my my theory is that it would uh, bolster your immune system to have, you know, not maybe not all the time, but at least often, you know, different kinds of foods, plants, etc., because you'd have a much larger diversity of microbiome in you. And that is, to me, that's information. You know, these microbes are capable of taking different substances and and processing them and, you know, doing things with them. And then, and then let's say you're going to get sick or you're exposed to a pathogen. I would would think your microbiome would would be more likely to identify it, maybe uh, guard against Mm -hmm. it from infecting you because if there's more different microbes there, there's more, I'm going to call it intelligence on what to do. Mm -hmm. It's not so foreign because there's so much different, uh, so many different microbes in there, again, processing your food. And, mm-hmm. you know, they're, they're all, what do you call it? I guess it's mutualistic. They're all there to work for you and for themselves. So they're all our partners. So the more we have yeah. of them, the more different uh, talents we have, the, the healthier yeah, I think right, we'll right. stay. This is just my theory. Yeah, no, I like that you've um, you've led into this with the idea of information. That this is a process of information acquisition. I think that's a really great analogy to make, and I I agree entirely. Um, I think there's some things I could sort of uh, I'll just sort of needle in there with um, maybe a bit of tweaking on your hypothesis. Um, so first of all, sure. for for a you know someone consuming a much more complex diet that may be conferring all of this microbial diversity. It's not yet, we're not yet certain how that translates into actual immune health and actual immune robusticity. And, and this is going to definitely differ person to person, depending on that person's individual life history. What was their sort of, um, their, the, their developmental history? Uh, do they have any other, do they have susceptibility to other diseases? Do they actually, are, are they actually living with some sort of chronic disease? Um, but by and large, most people also have some form of intestinal barrier dysfunction and disruption. And I'm talking about almost anybody you know. Um, Almost everybody to some degree uh, has some kind of allergy or reaction to something in the environment, which means that there is a uh, inflammatory or reactive um, occurrence happening at the mucosal uh, barrier between you and the environment. And this is some sort of reaction of your immune system to some uh, kind of breach, uh, you know, between you and the environment. Um, and this seems to be rapidly increasing in, in our society, at least, um, probably by a myriad of, from a myriad of factors, uh, um, such as sanitation and the types of foods that we eat, the amount of stress that we have, the lack of sleep, um, antibiotics, pesticides, you name it. So I, I would first just caution about how much we actually know um, we you know about diversity and changes in the microbiome and health improvements or improvements in in the immune system. Um, I think consuming a more nutritious diet is going to obviously confer more nutrients to you directly, um, not just from excuse me uh, microbial activity on these nutrients, but but actually in your primary digestive system. So you're actually going to be receiving more minerals, more vitamins. So this is going to make you healthier. This is going to um, fortify your your immune system, your body, um, and able and enable it to react um, much more smoothly to you know whatever the um, the seasonal allergen may be or whatever the um, particular 
flu or pathogen that's running around. So there's kind of caveat number one. Uh, number two, um, as far as, let's see what you were saying was, um, you think there'd be much more information exchange and therefore we'd be able to train the immune system better by having a uh, diversity of, of microbiota and that they're commensal and working for us. But as far as their commensality, um, or the, sorry, their mutualism, their mutualism. Um, again, they, so mutualism is not an automatic trait of the microbiome. Um, it can be mutualistic to some degree, uh, but by and large, it's, it's symbiotic or, or merely commensal in that it lives with us and inside of us, and it needs us, and we need it. But it's always a push-pull kind of relationship. We are always having, our immune system is there to keep this microbial community in line. Um, once our immune system goes away, as in once we die, the microbes take over. So there is kind of, there is a sort of tension between the two. Um, we live with each other. We support each other. We avail common goods um, in the form of nutrients and an, and an environment for them to live and, and be happy and thrive. Um, we also exert pressure so that we can kind of dictate the kinds of communities that we would want to have, the ones that are producing things that are good for us or beneficial or signaling um, for us. And, and they do the same. They kind of exert their own systemic pressures in, in the environment that they live in so that they can sort of control the other types of species that are living around them. They can control um, maybe fluidity of the environment or acidity and, and these kinds of parameters. And sometimes they can get out of whack and sometimes they are not entirely good for us. Um, and, and you can experience this, uh, you know, at any given time, if, you, if you've eaten something that didn't, you'd say it didn't agree with you, gives you indigestion, you can kind of you immediately feel this kind of perturbation going on. Maybe, um, you know, maybe we're just getting a little bit too nitty gritty here, but uh, you know, you sense that there is a change in, <laughs> inside of you. And, um, and this change can be and actually rapidly assessed. Um, so if, if you just had a, a stool sample from uh, pre- meal and then post meal you could probably pick this up almost immediately in in the, the fluctuation of the taxonomic representation so you know just to conclude i you know i would just say that it, there's there's not this one to one association we don't know what diversity really means we don't know that we can't say that all of these microbial members are exactly um, our friends and imparting good things that we want them to impart to us mm. Well, here's kind of a, a mind bender. So if you think about the digestive system, we have a microbiome of the mouth. We probably have a, a different microbiome of the esophagus, is my guess. Then in the stomach, it's so acidic. I mean, maybe there are creatures that live there. Maybe not. I don't know. They probably are. Then the small mm -hmm. intestine, then the large intestine. So if I'm a microbe that hangs out in the large intestine, how, what's my relationship with the microbes that are in front of me, the small intestine? You know, do I communicate with them and depending on what they do, I get different nutrients. You know, what about the mouth? Does the mouth microbiome communicate with, you know, the intestine because they're quote unquote processing first or eating first. So uh, mm -hmm. is there a hierarchy of, uh, of bacteria and other, you know, creatures that as you go through the digestive system and what's that communication look like? Yeah. Oh, it's such a great question. And again, it, it's something that we've, there's there's kind of a black box in the middle of, of that because um, a lot of these sites are so hard to sample, especially on a living person, and so invasive. So um, from from about the the, the early phase the, of the colon um, and then up through the small intestine, this this is nearly it just entirely dark matter to us. Um, but yeah, I think you know you're you're really Again, you're, you're onto something about this chain of command or this sort of chain of information flow from mouth to anus. So there's, there's a starting point and then there's an end point. In between, there's a lot of interaction going on depending on who has um, interacted with these substrates first and what they've produced. Um, we do know that in animals that have um, different, very specified regions of the colon, there are uh, such as um, hindgut fermenters. Uh, 
they may have saculated colons that actually in different regions within the large intestine, they have different communities and microbes that perform very different functions. And to probably a lesser degree, this is also true for humans and, um, and, and for other omnivores. So I would say it's, it's very likely that you, you, know, you would have different populations if, if you could even call it a microbiome in something in, in the esophagus and the stomach, um, I'm not so sure, but certainly there is going to be microorganisms that are there. Um, as to the degree and relevance of their function, uh, it, it's really hard to say, and I would, I would postulate that it's possibly not so relevant in terms of our um, sort of overall uh, function and, and overall what, what's uh, being produced from what we're consuming. Certainly in the mouth, there's a lot of activity. Um, but my hypothesis or, or my intuition would be that if anything is, is really living in a community sense in the esophagus or in the stomach, um, that these would really sort of be there as a kind of um, environmental keepers as in maintaining a kind of status quo of the environment or, or aiding in doing so, or maybe just living and getting by. Um, but I think we're really where microbial activity really comes into play would be in the mouth and then probably uh, parts of the small intestine and of course into the colon. Um, as for how much these groups communicate with each other, well, there is increasing evidence that uh, the environment of the mouth does have connections with um, all kinds of uh, sort of systemic uh, environments and um, systems such as even even the uh, vascular system. And so we're actually seeing connections between atherosclerosis in the mouth, uh, or sorry, atherosclerosis of the, of the arterial system and um, uh, periodontitis in the mouth, so uh, gum disease. Um, whether or not there's a direct correlation between uh, microbes that are uh, part of gum disease and um, the buildup of the plaque in, the, in your vascular tissue, uh, kind of remains to be seen, but um, certainly there's some sort of connection between the inflammation, the inflammatory processes that are at play here. Um, so I wouldn't say quite that this is a hierarchy, but certainly there is a chain of command or there is a chain um, that is, by, I, I would assume, is sort of mediated by the sort of systemic um, activity and environment of the body. And so the body, I think, is really regulating or the connection between these groups of microorganisms and um, kind of relaying uh, what's happening in one place to what ultimately happens in another place and uh, obviously bringing the kind of metabolites or the, the products of uh, microbial activity and transferring them around to um, different environments that then play into how the next set of microorganisms are going to react and what their uh, metabolism will look like. Right? And I guess overall, this is, it's, it's such a great question, but it's, it's so much, there's so much that we don't know about how these all interface together and what it means for our health overall. Yeah, there's a lot of questions. I mean, it's, I guess, you know, I won't go crazy and ask you all, but I guess there's one more. So, you know, okay. a given person has, their immune system, which has a memory, it knows what, what has gone before to some extent, you know, what it's been attacked by before, and it has its own microbiome at that point. So when a new bacteria or a virus enters the organism, who is vetting that thing to see whether it's friend or foe? And who's involved in that decision? Is it, you know, obviously, obviously the immune system, but what about the microbiome itself? You know, if you have... Yeah. 5,000 different kinds of bacteria in you and 12,000 different kinds of viruses and a new one comes along. How do you know if it's friend or foe? And again, who's sitting on the, the council, you know, uh, vetting this <laughs> thing? I, I, I would think it's cooperative between, you know, the immune system and the microbiome. This communication yeah. there is my bet to, to yeah, say, what right. do we do with this thing that's here? Welcome it or kill it. You know? Right, right. That's, that's funny. So they form, yeah, sure. Our, our microbial systems and our, and our immune system may form the great council. <laughs> To evaluate uh, any kind of newcomers, um, and it, it most certainly would depend on how this newcomer has entered the body. Uh, uh, you know, who's going to interface with it first? If it's some sort of, um, uh, you know, blood pathogen, then the immune system is going to 
to be on it right away. Uh, if it's something that's entering from airways or from food or from water sources, then um, yeah, most likely we're going to have some sort of uh, first pass, you know, kind of uh, assessment from the microbial community. And this is where diversity really comes into play. I think that is where it's really important um, because I think when you have uh, these microbial communities kind of um, working uh, in, a, in a very dynamic system with, with a lot of kind of feedback and a lot of interaction, then they also work together to um, exclude and can have a lot of different ways and systems to actually assess or sense uh, an intruder, a foreign intruder that may be pathogenic. Yeah, so exactly what you're saying. Um, I think there is there's a sort of two two way interface here of the microbiome gets to assess an intruder and and certainly uh, the immune system. But I think if it's something like uh, a food pathogen, foodborne pathogen, then we ultimately want our microbiome to deal with it because once it starts to interfere with our own immune system, that's when we get sick and that's when we have um, the more extreme reactions and, and the extreme discomfort that, that comes with mm. having uh, some sort of, you know, what we say as a stomach bug. Um, right. So, you know, ultimately, I think it's it's better if we can just leverage the activity of uh, microbial systems that are within us to kind of help shelter us, help, you know, keep out all the bad guys. So what, what questions are you looking at right now in your research? You know, what do you hope to answer in the next year or two? Oh, my gosh. So so actually, my research is, um, is quite diverse. And I only really stumbled into microbiome research um, in the beginning of my PhD. And and I dabbled in it a bit there. I, I went on to do a, a postdoc at the University of Oklahoma, where I was I was really um, getting much more into the study of microbiomes and specifically in ancient microbiomes. Um, and I'm also doing projects uh, looking at um, actual human genetic variability and the adaptation to, to human diet itself um, that doesn't include a microbial component. So, so I have a lot of kind of future um, areas of interest that I'm working in. Um, but one thing that I've been really curious about and wanting to kind of follow up on is is exploring networks of gene functions in different microbiomes to understand if there's any kind of patterns that may emerge um, for humans especially, but also even for um, terrestrial animals uh, with complex brains. And I, what I'm, I'm really interested in and in how we have come to develop this complex brain and enables this complex cognition that we have. And, and there are obviously other examples of of animals with large brains as well, our great ape cousins, um, and dolphins, whales, of course, uh, elephants. And, but what's really interesting to me is that the terrestrial component, meaning that we're removed from this rich watery resource, um, the, the ocean system that can confer pretty much all of the underpinnings of life. And so once you're on a terrestrial ecosystem, you have, um, a bit more limitation in the kinds of structural and nutritional resources that are at play. And so I, I really want to look into microbiomes as uh, potentially a way of uh, compensating for anything that may be missing in the, in the terrestrial food web. And so I, was, um, I, I did a temporary postdoc fellowship where I was looking at different uh, gene functions and pathways. Um, specifically a lipid lipid metabolism to try and see if there were any patterns that stood out um, um, among terrestrial, particularly terrestrial Ethereum mammals, um, and and then also looking at humans and comparing these to uh, other systems in in diverse environments and as well as uh, um, aquatic and marine animals. Um, Moving on from there, I've been I've been pursuing work and trying to reconstruct different ancient microbiome features. I won't say ancient microbiomes themselves. It's, I think it's still kind of an open question as to whether or not um, a, a full intact microbiome can actually be preserved um, in from an ancient context and depending on the source that you're looking at. Um, but these would be highly degraded, and so likely you're talking about a huge taxonomic. Um, and gene representation drop out. And so it's, it's uh, at least in my mind, it will be impossible to fully reconstruct an ancient microbiome. But 
I think it'd be really interesting to see what kinds of features we can tease out from uh, sources of, of ancient microbiomes, such as from dental calculus or from coprolites or for, even from sediment and soil context um, and other archaeological materials. Um, so that's that's something I'm kind of actively working on. Um, and from there, uh, I guess my other, my you know, my my main my day job is really to experimentally understand um, the nutritional role of uh, of salivary amylase, which is why we tend to have a lot of starch in our diet. We talk we think about starch as also being um, a prominent source of microbial fermentation, but um, but in fact, of course, we can we produce the enzymes endogenously that uh, help us break down and ultimately. Uh, digest and receive energy from starch-containing foods. So um, in some way, it's all related. It all comes back to diet and nutritional acquisition in humans. But uh, um, that's what I'm working on right now, and that's what I'm pursuing. Well, that's quite a bit. Well, what's the what's the way um, for listeners to find out more about your work and get in contact if they have questions? Well, okay. I I guess I, I don't maintain so much of an online presence, but I do have a, a Twitter account that I occasionally post about things that I'm working on or publications that I'll be putting out. Um, it's uh, Twitter, and then my handle would be my last name with a A X at the end, so Schnorak. And um, oh, I guess anybody could Google me, and I, I'm as I said, I I have a um, postdoctoral uh, fellowship that I'm I'm based at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Uh, I have an online profile there, and um, I'm also a visiting research fellow at the Conrad Lorenz Institute in Klosterneuburg in Austria. Um, it's the Center of Advanced Studies in Life and Sustainability Sciences. So uh, I have a, a very nice um, online presence there as well, and uh, a couple of some descriptions of the projects that I've been working on while I'm here, and also jointly uh, with the University of Nevada with my current postdoctoral fellowship. So um, I'm... I'm I think I'm I'm fairly uh, transparent on the web for anything that I'm doing and currently actively working on. All right, very good. Well, Stephanie, thanks for coming on the podcast today. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Again, thanks so much for having me. It was a real pleasure to talk to you. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Thank you.